So thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to introduce Neil Cohen. Um, of course, as many of you know, Neil received his PhD here in California, at the University of California at San Diego, where he worked with Larry Squire. Uh, he was then a postdoctoral research fellow and a research scientist at uh, MIT, where he worked with Sue Corkin. He then became a faculty member at Johns Hopkins University uh, and then moved to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1990, where he's professor of psychology, uh, the program in neuroscience, and the Beckman Institute. Uh, he serves as director for the Center for Nutrition, Learning, and Memory and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Initiative. And in 2012, he was named a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which recognized his amazing achievements in the field of memory and amnesia, which of course includes his collaborations with Howard Eichenbaum, and you'll hear more about uh, that today. Um, but before I turn it over to Neil, and, uh, and of course you can you know, see his many accomplishments and, and papers and, and theory online, I'd actually like to give you a bit of a story um, and lighten the mood a little bit <laughs> to tell you about um, how amazing Neil is as a, as a teacher and a mentor, so hopefully you can indulge me for a, for a few minutes. So if you've ever met Neil or been in the room with him for longer than a couple of minutes, you know he's extremely extroverted. He's larger than life, and he loves hanging out with people. He loves talking about science, and he loves debating ideas. And conferences like this one are his absolute favorite. And he used to always tell me, you know, where else can you go and hang out with all of your best friends and talk about all these amazing ideas? You know, conferences are absolutely the best. And he would always bring that love of scientific interaction back with him into the lab. Uh, so when I was a grad student in Neil's lab back in the, in the late 90s, it turns out there was a, a number of us in the lab who were particularly introverted, so quite the opposite of, of Neil in, in this manner. And invariably, Neil would bound into the, into the lab and say, hey, guess what? I've got great news. You know, Professor so-and-so, we'll call him Buddy. Professor Buddy is going to come visit us in a couple of days, and you're going to show him all the latest and greatest things that you've been working on. Isn't that amazing? And you know, as young, introverted graduate students, we would think, no. <laughs> That's, that sounds terrifying. This sounds, this sounds awful. <laughs> and so he would continue on. He would ignore these expressions of fear on our faces. And he would continue on and say, well, what are you going to show him? What are you going to show, buddy? Let's, let's hear it. You mean right now? <laughs> yeah, right now. Show me. Show me all these things that you've got. So then you, you had to go through in that moment and figure out what pieces of, of data, what your narrative was going to be. And so Neil would, would work through this with you. Um, but then, without fail, in the middle of, of going over data, he would stop you and he'd say, oh, you know what? You know what would be really great? Remember, remember how we talked last week in lab meeting about that paper? You should tell Buddy what you think about his paper. <laughs> what? <laughs> really? So then we'd all try to play dumb at this moment and say, you know, I don't, I don't remember a paper. I don't... <laughs> I didn't read any, anything. <laughs> and, he, and he would brush this off and he'd say, no, 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 you remember. And you know, when he does this, you're in trouble, right? So you remember in the lab meeting, we talked about this, you said he got that control condition wrong. And if he had done <laughs> just these three other things, it would have completely changed the data and the interpretation of the data. You should tell him that. <laughs> And he would giggle, and he would just look up at the sky and think, you know, wistfully about how amazing this is going to be, and do a little happy dance, and, <laughs> and we'd go on. So the day would come, you know, Professor Buddy would come to the lab, and sure enough, we would show him all the different pieces of, uh, you know, of experiments we were working on, and you know, that moment would come when Neil would say, "Hey, Jen, tell tell Buddy over here what you think of his last paper." And again, he would giggle, and he would just sit back, and he would, he would watch this discussion unfold. And every time, you know, it, it just devolved into this amazing, lovely conversation about science. So this scenario happened to each of us in the lab multiple times, but as terrifying as these moments were for us, I think it illustrates in, in a few different ways how great a mentor Neil was. And so the first reason is that, you know, Neil obviously would always push us out of our comfort zone. So whether this was in these 
social interactions or giving a presentation, it didn't matter. Um, he would always push us to that next step to be something, something greater than we were in that moment. But as often as he would throw us into this deep end of the pool, he would make sure that we really knew how to swim. So he always prepared us. We would always go over these conversations about data and ideas at length so that way we would be prepared. We would have some confidence moving forward. And finally, he would always make sure that we got quality face time with leaders in the field. And this, you know, this is really important and still is really important. We heard Lynn Nadell earlier in the week talk about this diversity gap that we have in science. Um, and it still exists in, in large part today, you know, especially at the, at the higher levels of the field. And Neil was always great in that it didn't, it didn't matter you know, who you were. It didn't matter your age or your gender or your race or anything. He made sure that you got good quality time with some of the prominent thinkers. And he made sure that his friends, these prominent thinkers in the field, really took you seriously and that they really had to contend with your ideas and how you thought about that work. And that really gave us this wonderful foundation to launch from, you know, to really have this confidence to go on and have our own independent uh, careers in the field. So for this, I'm eternally grateful. I know that a number of other students are as well. And of course, the cycle now continues. So when I get to visit Neil uh, at Illinois, I'm professor buddy. <laughs> so I get to have these wonderful one-on-one -on -one conversations with the students where they get to tell me all about their latest and greatest findings. And they also get to tell me about a few quirks in my work that maybe I could have done things a little bit better. <laughs> so these lovely interactions about science uh, get to continue with the next generation of students. So thank you for indulging me. And with that, please join me in welcoming Neil Cohen. Well, thank you very much for those overly generous remarks. I'm not sure I remember it exactly the same way, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, a lot of thanks first. Thanks to Mike and Manuela for this amazing conference. It really is extraordinary. Uh, in the spirit of the converse of the last speaker who talked a lot about reactivation, this event reactivates for me wonderful memories of being at Irvine in general, and, and those earliest uh, meetings, which, which uh, are very, very memorable, as this one is, is uh, shaping up to be. Thanks for that. Thanks for uh, uh, having, uh, having me come this particular week when it's snowing in Illinois. <laughs> and thanks so much, Mike, for the opportunity to, uh, to give this tribute, tribute to Howard. So I had the great good fortune of, of knowing Howard, working with Howard, collaborating with Howard, uh, and being great friends with Howard for the great majority of my professional life. So I'm going to start by giving a, a somewhat more personal tribute to Howard, sharing some stories with you, uh, not unlike the story that Jen shared, sharing some stories with you, and then talking about his work. Uh, and the contributions, the, some of the amazing contributions. I'm going to do this at a pretty high level. I'm going to talk more about those ideas and how those ideas drove his work and other, people work, other people's work. The best tribute, the best way to honor him is, is by attending to what it is he contributed to the field. And in many of the uh, places, I will talk about the work I did that, are, that, that has to do with those ideas, that provide evidence for those ideas. And here's a little bit of a roadmap. Uh, it's a lot of uh, topics, it looks like, and I'll help you out. Well, you can see where you are in the talk uh, with that thing. <laughs> so first, Howard. Uh, as I said, I've known him most of my uh, professional life. I didn't know him in those first two pictures. He's the little one in uh, the left, upper leftmost one. Um, but uh, we were friends and collaborators since the early 80s. This is Howard over the years. Uh, and I, I do want to tell you a story about how it is we first met, because it's still such a strange story to me. Um, in uh, January of 1981, after finishing my thesis at UC San Diego with Larry Squire, I left the 88-degree weather of Southern California and went to Boston with my wife Maureen, to, to where I would be a postdoc at MIT, and we arrived, and it was four degrees below zero, the coldest, day, coldest January 5th on record. 
And we get to the place which we had rented sight unseen, and it was absolutely uninhabitable. <laughs> what are we going to do now? So Sue Corkin took us in for a little while, but we were pretty much stuck. And it came to pass that uh, Karen Shedlock, who was a, a, a research technician in Sue Corkin's lab, was at the time dating Howard Eichenbaum and came and, and saw him one evening and said, oh, I got to tell you, this poor postdoc just came from San Diego. He's got no place to live. I mean, it's really <laughs> pathetic. And Howard's, Howard says, oh, who is he? And she says, Neil Cohen. And he says, oh, I just read his paper in science, the thing in the middle, just read his paper in science, tell him he could live with me. <laughs> what? <laughs> who does that? It's crazy, right? But we did, and then that started an amazing, uninterrupted friendship and collaboration, truly out of the housing situation in Boston. We lived with him on one of, the one of those floors, one of the floors of that uh, building, of his flat in Wellesley, and he even conspired to have me do some teaching at Wellesley in addition to my postdoc at MIT. So we grew up professionally together and commiserated together and celebrated together and found tons of ways to uh, excuses or opportunities to get together uh, to talk science and to get our families together and check out those mustaches, huh? <laughs> uh, incredible. There's also the question of what good Jewish boys named Cohen and Eichenbaum are doing standing around a Christmas tree in the upper right, but I think that's a different talk. I'm going to tell you a quick Wellesley story together. So he and I each taught in psychobiology or uh, uh, aspects of neuroscience and physiology uh, in, in different courses and got to meet lots of uh, uh, the Wellesley undergrads. And then one day we're in the uh, Wellesley College Student Center around Easter time and there's this display case filled with these beautiful Easter eggs. This wonderful Easter egg display, each Easter egg more beautiful and more elaborate than the last one. And then on a shelf was this. No explanation, no card, no last name, just this. What? <laughs> okay then, and what are Cohen and Eichenbaum doing in an Easter egg display? I don't know that either. So, uh, you know Howard from his work, and we'll get back to his work in just a moment, but he, there was this other thing about Howard that some of you knew. He had a Baseball Parks of America tour with his two sons, uh, Alex and Adam. He took them to every baseball park in America over the course of six summers across 15 years. And 15 years is long enough, of course, that some, some baseball parks are decommissioned and new ones appear and they had to go to those too. And they went to every one of those parks and they had hot dogs at every one of those parks and they slept in lousy hotels at, around every one of those parks as his children grew up. And you know this happened over the year because in the upper picture on the right, he's the same size as his two sons and this changes over the years, as you can see. <laughs> What less of you might know is the Steakhouses of America tour that Howard and I used to go on together at every venue, every place we were jointly giving a talk, say at this one, we would go find a great steakhouse and, and further advance our ideas and our friendship. There's the Whiskies of Scotland tour when he was on sabbatical with Richard Morris. Thank you, Richard. And the Coens and Eichenbaums went off and toured the Isle of Skye and discovered lots of uh, wonderful whiskies. And that's how Macallan came to be a big part of the Eichenbaum and Cohen families. One more thing along these lines, and then I get to move on. And um, uh, during one of our ma many excuses to get together, we were in Verona at a meeting, and we went to the Verona Arena. This is a Roman amphitheater that opened in 30 AD, but now is, uh, 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 is a place where you can see fantastic concerts and whatever. And it also hosted Howard and Neil talking about our next grant and our next paper, just the two of us in this <laughs> amphitheater from 30 AD. Didn't matter where it was, we were determined to explore issues about how, how memory works in the brain, how it supports a variety of, of our behavioral repertoire, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do now is talk about the, uh, what I'm going to do over the rest of the talk is show you a set of claims that we have made that the rest of his career was about providing the very best empirical data for, and I'll show you a little bit of the empirical data that I did 
uh, uh, in, in regard to that. But I'll make the claim, claims really uh, clear. The first one gets back to something that Jim McGaw talked about in the opening talk for this conference. Several of the plenary speakers gave uh, insights from Aristotle or Gaul or other famous philosophers and scientists. Mine, I think, is best described by Tennessee Williams, a playwright <laughs> who said, life is all memory, except for the one present moment that goes by so quickly you can hardly catch it going. What are the brain mechanisms that permit you to catch it before it passes by? Okay? All of that is memory, and that's why the peop all of us here are so excited and energized about uh, and are honored to be able to study memory in the brain. So let me start with a couple of the claims and we'll step through things. Memory is a fundamental property of the brain, the whole brain, all the parts of its brain, and its storage is intimately tied to ongoing information processing in the brain. In many ways, in many areas, it's indistinguishable from the processing of information. And yet, and yet, there are functionally and anatomically distinct memory systems of the brain that help memory be manifested in a multitude of ways. And we'll talk about some of those systems. Um, there's a basic distinct, distinction that started our work together based upon the, the, my thesis work distinguishing between declarative and procedural memory. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, from there, we went on to show that, or claim, that declarative memory depends critically on the hippocampus in interactions with cortical systems. And that push, that thing about interactions, is something else that came up from the very first talk in this, uh, in this conference and is uh, throughout all of the symposia in this conference. Though we're talking about the hippocampus and its role in a particular aspect of memory from the very beginning, our ideas always were that the hippocampus interacts with a variety of systems in the medial temporal lobe and that in turn with a variety of cortical areas in order to support any of what the hippocampus does. And that this system, one of several systems one could articulate, here we just distinguish between procedural, declarative, and an emotional memory system, which you heard much more about from Liz uh, this, uh, just before this talk, those also interact in, in important ways, heavily uh, important ways. So that they're separable does not mean they are independent forever. Okay, just want to make that point. So, another aspect of this work that I want to emphasize is the utter commitment, the total commitment to reconciling data from across tasks, across domains, across paradigms, across species. We want to understand how memory works, in, how memory is instantiated in the brain. We want to be able to generate a theory. We want, we want to uh, uh, challenge people to generate ideas that encompass data across all of those tasks, all of those, all of those domains, all of those species. How do you do that? In our night, and I'll give you a couple of quotes along the way. In our 1993 book, Howard and I wrote, we embarked on a systematic program of collaborative work on the idea of corresponding memory mechanisms in humans and rodents. What was required in order to really work simultaneously on humans and rodents, he generating data in rodents, I generating data in humans, us both committed to uh, encompassing all those data and more, was an articulation of the functional role of the hippocampal system in memory and of the nature of the memory impairment amnesia that would permit the experimental, per, experimental predictions for studies performed on any species and would permit us to make contact with and contribute to work ranging from cognitive processes to neural mechanisms. It's crazy, ambitious goal, but we're committed to this idea that an explanation has to explain more than one task, more than one species. So just to give one very quick example of some of the parallels, on the left are results uh, from the 1980 uh, paper by Cohen and Squire showing intact uh, skill learning, preserved learning and retention of skill and amnesia. Down at the bottom you see three uh, mirror reversed words. The task of a subject in this task was to read a series of those triads, word triads. It's really hard backwards, you have to read them aloud, we time how long it takes. You read lots and lots of words, some of them repeat, some of them, most of the rest are novel, and we measure how long it takes you to read, and what you see graphed here are for three different instances of amnesia, skill learning. People get faster and faster at reading the mirror reversed words. They retain it over three months. In this example, they come back three months later and, and they continue to move right along in the usual way of skills, 
Patients with amnesia following, uh, patients with amnesia were perfectly normal at this. And then everyone was better at the words that repeated over and over again, so uh, even uh, additional increment in reading speed. And yet the patients couldn't remember which words they had read. In formal tests, explicit tests of memory, they're unable to say that capricious, bedraggled, and grandiose, for those of you who weren't able to do the mirror re reversed reading, were unable to say those were words on the list. Okay? On the right is a kind of animal version of this, olfactory discrimination learning on, every, on any given day. Animals, this is Howard's work, on any given day, animals were shown two, uh, were presented with two olfactory cues. One is rewarded, one is not. They have to learn which is which. And uh, you can see how many trials to criterion it takes. And on the second day, a different pair. On the third day, a different pair. And you see first, that all the animals get faster and faster, including animals with um, um, a fornix lesion interrupting the hippocampal pathway or fornix plus amygdala lesion. But on the fourth day, there's a reversal of the pair they learned on the third day. And animals who are amnesic perform better than normal control animals. We made this prediction. Actually, our collaboration hinged on this prediction with Howard saying, if you're right about this skill learning thing as distinct from this memory thing, we should be able to find a task in which animals with hippocampal damage are better than normal animals. And they were here because they didn't remember the contingencies from the previous day. Normal animals come in and say, hey, what's the deal? I know that the rose odor is, is positive, and the other, what are you doing to me? And they get all, yeah, and it's not good in the way you heard from Liz. The animals who are amnesic do just fine. I don't recommend being amnesic, but in this case, you see this parallel, the distinction between two kinds of memory. As to our commitment to try to encompass all of the data, we're talking about data, electrophysiological recording data from animals, lesion data from animals, uh, different kind of neuro, neuroimaging data, behavioral data, and, and uh, neuropsychological data from humans of a variety of kinds. Any of you who have ever read any of Howard's work or seen any of his talks will recognize his, his rodent in deep, deep in thought. All of, in all of his experiments, he is, it's about what the animal, what choices the animal makes, which depend on what kind of memory. It depends on hippocampal memory, and they have damaged hippocampus, of course, they're going to be impaired if, if it depends on something else uh, they're spared. Another aspect of Howard's work I want to just really emphasize is he was able to bring olfactory memory as a main uh, uh, way of testing rodents. It turns out to be an incredibly powerful way to explore performance and memory in rodents. Um, and it, it reflects an interesting point. When I, say, when I talk about reconciling data from human and, animal, human and animals, I don't mean the same task. I mean tasks that get at the same uh, processes, tasks that, those, that are appropriate for those species. And the visual modality was not nearly as good in these memory studies of rodents as was the olfactory modality. And Howard was just superb at, at inventing tasks in which you can look at memory for individual items and memory for the relations among items in the olfactory domain. It's a very important piece of, of how that work happened. Um, in reconciling, so I'm saying we can do, we can do studies simultaneously in, in animals and humans and trying to reconcile those data. One of the things, uh, uh, but that you have to pay attention to what the, uh, what the species is like, how they perform, what, it, what that task is like in their environment. And in most studies of humans, many, many studies of humans, the task revolves around explicit remembering of something and explicit reporting of something. And that's not so easy to get at in, in rodents. And if that's what the hippocampus does, if the hippocampus is about explicit remembering as its fundamental basis, um, it's going to be hard to, do the, to, to reconcile that. So I'm going to show you a quick example of studies that, that make us not worry about that nearly as much. This one from Jen Ryan um, when she was in the lab. And in this study, we used eye movements there in the right corner as our measure, as a method of assessing memory, see where people look as a function of their prior experience. In this task during study time, individuals saw a series of items, a bicycle, little Ricky, a uh, little pathway, 
um, and, some, and they get repeated a number of times, and then at test time they see items, it could be a brand new one, it could be one that's a repetition of one they've seen before, or it could be one that is a manipulated version. I'll go over here. Um, what I want you to see here is at test time, these are two identical scenes, the both identical scenes. In one case, it's a repetition of what the individual saw just before, saw on the list before. In the other case, it's a manipulated version. This is really hard to see, but there's a set of, there's a set of people on the rocks and on the path that are walking in this version. If the manipulated version is you remove it and you ask, how much time is spent, how much viewing occurs to this empty region? It's empty in both cases. In this case, it's always been empty. In this case, there used to be people there. Maybe people will look there if they remember the relationship between the people in that region. And what you're seeing are eye movement data, the crosses are eye fixations, the red lines are saccades as you move from one location to, to the next. And sure enough, if this region has always been empty, there's, people don't look there. Here, if, if, there, if it had been previously filled, now memory is guiding viewing to this empty region. But, but, so here are some data, how much of your eye movements are directed to that, what, that region. Uh, novel, repeated, manipulated. You see more viewing of that region when it's been manipulated, but not if you're an amnesic patient. Patients with damage to the hippocampus do not show that effect. They do not look at that empty region. The part about explicit remembering is this effect in normal folks occurs that the eyes look in the empty region is true whether they can explicitly remember that that region was previously filled or not. So the eyes know when, the, when the, patient, the subjects themselves do not. So this permits us to take very seriously the ability to look at aspects of memory in humans at the same time as memory in rodents and, and other primates, et cetera, et cetera. So back to claims. Next claim. Representation, in our view, the way we're going to do this is organize our activities around, around what is the representation supported by the hippocampal system. So representation is central to understanding and test, te testing hippocampal function across tasks, across domains, across species. And that, the declar that declarative memory in the hippocampal system is fundamentally relational. So Howard and I revisited these ideas in this paper in Neuron in 2014. Again, asking how does the literature about spatial exploration, navigation, cognitive maps align with the literature and the study of humans about people's memory for events. What happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? And the like. And our view is that the memory and spatial functions of the hippocampus, our view all along has been that memory and spatial functions of the hippocampus can be reconciled by extending hippocampal function beyond navigation and allocentric space to the organization of events in spatial context, to non-spatial organizations including time and more, and to the larger sense of navigation through a memory space. So again, I just want to make sure these two claims, representation is critical, and the kind of representation we're talking about in this system is fundamentally relational. This particular position is something we uh, articulated in the very earliest of our writings, just to give you some examples. Uh, two papers from 1988, one in Trends in Neuroscience, representation in the hippocampus, what a hippocampal neurons code, and the other, hippocampal dysfunction, hippocampal system dysfunction and odor discrimination learning in rats, impairment of facilitation depending on representational demands, both in electrophysiological recordings and in behavioral outcomes. What we're looking at is the relationship of hippocampal function to memory for relations among things. Let me move on to a few more claims, and then I can articulate much more clearly this theory about what the hippocampus does that, that drove Howard, that's supported by and drove Howard's work and my own. The hippocampus supports and hippocampal neurons code relational representations at multiple scales, spatially and temporally. It supports the binding of the relations among the constituent elements of experience into memory and their later reactivation. Hippocampal relational representations are promiscuously accessible to multiple brain systems and can be used flexibly in service of navigation, in service of explicit remembering, in service of inferential reasoning, future imagining, creative thinking, decision making, and more. 
because of its openness to these other systems, because those representations can be used that way. That's a lot of words, visual representation of it. The idea is that information from various cortical processors converges on the hippocampus, and it's part of this, part of, and it's part of the mechanism for binding together the different elements of experience. So the, so the hippocampus in interaction with neocortical processing and storage sites supports relational memory representations of the constituent elements of experience. It supports their binding into memory and their later reactivation. I want to give you one, give you one illustration of this, an example of a kind of event that the hippocampus supports. This is a trip, uh, and now I'm, uh, uh, it's a Howard story. This is a trip to Boulder, Colorado in May 2010 when his son, Al, eldest son Alex was uh, defending his honors thesis. So Howard and I conspire to get um, Alex to work with a former colleague of mine at Illinois who is now in Colorado and conspired to get me on his honors thesis committee. And his honors thesis involved uh, an oral component to it. So Howard flew me and himself out to be in the room when poor Alex has to defend his thesis not only to his committee but to us. Um, <laughs> talking about fear and uh, yeah, uh, Liz is still here. This is a paradigm you might want to try. Um, and so we went, we went to Boulder, it's a lovely place. Uh, we all got t-shirts, uh, Alex defended his thesis, he did a great job. Then we went to a great steak dinner, you know, part of the Steakhouses of America tour. We went to the Boulder Steak uh, 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 Chop House uh, and Tavern, I think. And um, a, a good time was had by all. Uh, Howard and I went back to our hotel, Alex went back to his apartment. Three in the morning, Howard has a gallstone attack and takes himself to the hospital. He wakes me up as he's leaving, the, going out the door, saying, I have to go to the emergency room. What? Uh, OK. So I go to the emergency room after a little while, and I rescue him, and we pull him out of that. And we then spent the next two days working on a Conti Center proposal for hippocampal prefrontal cortex interactions, a, a proposal that was funded, and that led to our next five years of work. How do we remember such things? The hippocampus together with its neocortical processing sites. Okay, representation. How can we explore issues of representation? Lots and lots of data that Howard and many, many people here have uh, explored in animals and, and, and relevant human data. I'll give you one animal and one human example real quickly. This is work that Howard did with Sam McKenzie in which animals were in one of two different contexts. And in each context, there was one or two possible positions where they got odors. And in each of those places, there were two possible odors. And then for each of the odor, it could be rewarded or not. Hmm. We believe the hippocampus is about, by, is about permitting representations of the relations among the various elements of experience. What do the, what do the neurons code? And in this work, they used um, this uh, wonderful techniques uh, involving representational similarity analysis to explore how much of the uh, coding is related to the specific items versus the positions versus the contexts and the like. And they found in the upper left, and they, and they recorded for multiple regions. In the upper left, you see the hippocampus and this beautifully orderly, beautiful orderly uh, representation, hierarchical representation, in which neuro neuron firing is related to all of the elements of the experience, but context, which context the odors were in, determines what gets rewarded and when, that's what's best encoded. That accounts for most of the uh, uh, variance in their data. That idea, uh, so, so Edvard was talking yesterday about the high dimensionality of hippocampal encoding. We would argue highly dimensional in that it's representing all of the elements, the relations among all of the elements of experience. Uh, on the human side, the, the uh, much more straightforward way of going about that, here in work by Alex Conkle in my lab, we gave people the set of trials. Each trial had three objects that unfolded in order and in three spatial locations. So all of these objects are novel, never have been seen and they can occur in temporal position one, temporal position two, or temporal position three, and they can occur in spatial position one, spatial position two, or spatial position three, and later on you have to remember all of that, you guys. And the way it's tested is a way in which we could explore how much do you know about the spatial relations independent of the temporal or other relations. 
We can test separately how much do you know about the temporal relations independently of space. How much do you know about just which things were part of the same trial, independent of which order and which location? Okay. Doing that, um, we look at memory in normal folks. Um, so uh, you see a set of four bars there under the comparison participants in the data slide, and then two sets of patients, one with damage restricted to hippocampus and one with damage more extensive throughout the medial temporal lobe. And for all of the probes of, of, of memory for relations, whether it was spatial relations or temporal relations or associative co-occurrence relations, patients with damage to hippocampus are profoundly impaired. So, memory and navigation. So memory and the things it supports, the things it's in service of. With regard to navigation, I love this, this paper by Howard, uh, one of his last papers, and its title in particular, The Role of the Hippocampus in Navigation is Memory. And the argument is very straightforward, that whereas the hippocampus is essential to spatial navigation via a cognitive map, its role derives from the relational organization and flexibility of cognitive maps and not from a selective role in the spatial domain. So it goes on to say more and ends with spatial navigation, spatial mapping and navigation are both a metaphor for and a prominent application of relational memory organization. And that's really the driver of, of a lot of uh, the work. So let me make the one point uh, clearer on this. Th these kinds of representations can be used by a multitude of systems and in service of navigation, explicit remembering, on and on and on. The hippocampus does not do navigation. That's not its sole purpose or explicit remembering, et cetera. Et, et cetera. It does memory in service of. I want to give you just uh, uh, one quick example uh, from work that Joel Voss did when he was in Illinois. Uh, and this is our version of navigation. Suppose you are driving in a car, you're in a car, you're either driving you're either driving and Joel Voss is next to you, or Joel is driving and you're next to him, and you travel around. And you both see the same things in the same order for the same amount of time, but who's likely to have better memory for that? person who's driving, who's making the active choices, who has active volitional control, is likely to, and in many, many studies, does have better memory uh, than the one who's receiving that information passively. We did this in the laboratory by having a set of 25 objects in a grid and a little viewing window, and you had a mouse that controlled where the viewing window was, and you got to move it at whatever rate you wanted to in order to uncover them so you can remember them later, okay? But for each subject, there was someone who was yoked to that subject who saw that person's active as their own passive. So I saw passively everything that, say, Jen, looked at and vice versa. So we could look at the difference between active and passive control. And what happens, and, and you can see where people move. People are free to move however they want. Uh, in the middle panel, you see blue, you see black and green bars. So green bars are when you're actively, you have active control. Black is when you do not. Uh, um, uh, so, sorry, better, better still. Hand shows when you have active control. Eyeball shows when you're just viewing passively. Memory is better when you're active than when you're passive. And Joel did about 15 experiments of this before we, we published this thing. But what's interesting is that it depends upon a particular way of exploring the items. So normal folks, but not patients with hippocampal damage, do this spontaneous revisitation. They're moving along some path and they go, whoa, whoa, what was that one? And they backtrack and they come forward and then they backtrack. So normal folks in the rightmost panel, about 30% of their transitions is this revisitation thing. Patients with amnesia do not do that, okay? And the revisiting thing is related to performance. In functional imaging studies, it's related to hippocampal activation and patients with hippocampal system damage do not do that strategy of exploring and their memory is poorer for it. Okay, relational memory binding, we're very nearly at the end. How do you pull together a cognitive map? How do you pull together a cognitive map? In this case here of Boston. So surely what happens is, for most people, you go to various places. If you're lucky, you get to explore various places and you try to learn where various things are and maybe you can remember which things you saw in which order, in which locations. And if you have an intact hippocampal system, you bind together those different elements, 
the different spatial locations, the different landmarks that were in those locations, the relations among them, what, how they fit into your temporal time, time frame, et cetera, et cetera. That's the idea. In the laboratory, one of the ways we've explored this, uh, Patrick Watson and, uh, did the first of what's a very large series of studies, incredibly simple, based on, on work that Smith and Milner did many, many years ago. Um, you see a set of objects in some array. You see it briefly. We then take it away for a short delay, only four seconds. We line them all up, up at the top, and your job is to reconstruct where they were. So it's a, it's a spatial reconstruction task. Excuse me. How well do you do at reconstruction? So let's go to the right. There's a study display, and then we see how well you reconstruct them. So there are different kinds of errors you can make. You could just put something in the wrong position, misplacement, and that's the measure that was always used uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Or you can ask, if you're interested in memory for the relations among things, you could ask whether people swap the locations of things. So for example, a, temp a swap in the temporal domain rather than the spatial domain is remembering me as having spoken first this morning and Liz as having spoken second. That would, be a, that would be a swap, a relational memory error in time. Here we're looking at it in space. So we analyze how often you see these kinds of swaps and all kinds of other errors. And what we find, what Patrick found is that patients with hippocampal system damage are unbelievably disproportionately likely to make swap errors instead of simple misplacement errors. In further work by Kevin Hereka, we can show that their ability to remember the locations, filled locations, regardless of what they're filled with, is, is pretty good, in fact, normal. Their ability to put the right thing that was bound to it is what's impaired. Um, uh, it's a pretty picture, so let me say a word. Uh, we are exploring the, how well this behavior ties to particular measures of hippocampal function. This measure of hippocampal function structure and structural integrity is called MR, magnetic resonance elastography. We measure the, the viscoelastic properties of structures in the brain by putting people in the magnet and moving them. Anyone who's ever done MRR studies is told never, ever, ever to move subjects. There are all these uh, uh, fantastic algorithms for removing motion. Here they have this pneumatic pillow, this, uh, this uh, resoundant pneumatic actuator system, which is a little pillow that moves you, tied in time to the acquisition cycle. So very small and very regular movement of the head causes the head to move with regard to the to this CSF, which cause shearing waves, it propagates shearing waves, and you can, just as when you throw rocks or pebbles or corks or something else into a pond, you see different ripples, different kinds of shearing waves, you can use that to reconstruct the viscoelastic properties of the brain. And using that, we can explore the viscoelastic properties of hippocampus, and we found in the lower left the viscoelastic properties of the hippocampus is remarkably well tied to relational memory performance as measured by swap errors in a group of people who are very nearly the same age and for which there's almost no change in hippocampal volume. So it's unrelated to hippocampal volume. This is a finer measure of the structural integrity of it. Um, okay. So what does this view of the world look like? Hippocampus and all of its partners in crime, in cortex and the other parts of the brain, exposed to episodes, tries to bind together spatial information, uh, what, ha what happened in space, what objects you encountered, what actions you did, and in time, space and time, and in regard to the context, the context in the room and your larger context, okay? That's what we say the hippocampal system is doing. It's also really important in your sampling of information, how you pull information in to be later remembered. I showed you one example of that with Joel Voss's work, and the last, thing, last experiment I'll show you is, is another example of hippocampus generating the information you need to guide, to guide subsequent behavior. So same study. The spatial reconstruction task, you see a small number of objects, there's a delay, then you reconstruct it. Lots and lots of trials. Here, Heather Lucas recorded eye movements while people looked at the, during the study phase. Where do the eyes move during the study phase? How regular, how predictable are the eye movements? How organized are the eye movements? 
So you can use an inf information theoret theoretic measure of entropy to ask how organized or constrained or ver uh, contrarily entropic they are. How frequently do they seem to bind with their eyes cer certain objects versus moving randomly? So uh, if you look at the two, um, the two panels on the lower, uh, lower portion of the slide, uh, high entropy would be you, look, you can go from anywhere to anywhere else. There's no particular ones you favor. On the right, that's low entropy. Entropy, that means more constrained, more organized. You look, there's fewer kinds of transitions. You repeat the same transitions over and over again. And uh, it turns out that the more organized your eye movement behavior, you, the better your subsequent memory, the fewer swap errors you make, unless you're a patient with hippocampal amnesia. If you're a patient with hippocampal amnesia, you have highly high entropy, poor organization in your eye movements poor memory subsequently, lots of swap errors. We believe you need the hippocampus to be part of memory-guided sampling of the environment. The very people whose memories of something are most likely to be poor also have poorer strategies for sampling the environment. Why? Because it's part of how you make decisions about how the hippocampus and its memory system is part of how you make those decisions for uh, advantageous optimal viewing. Okay, one more thing on this model. Uh, I just want to emphasize the multiple scales, both spatially, you need to remember, you could remember who is up on the stage, you might be able to remember who is in this room, you might be able to remember the relationship of this room to the rest of this building, you may be able to remember Huntington Beach with regard to the rest of Southern California, all is part of this same event, the same experience, same in time. There are multiple time scales that have to be brought together, and the hippocampus is a very important part of that. People, there are people in the room who have studied this. I'm going to give uh, one uh, unlikely example of that and close. And this is uh, work that Melissa Duff uh, and I did together on a phenomenon called reported speech. It's in, it's in a journal you're unlikely to have seen, the Journal of Aphasiology. It's a linguistic mechanism for bridging time, for talking across time. So if I uh, say, if I remind you now of what uh, Jen said, uh, whether true or not, in her introduction, or what Liz said in the talk before, that's an example of reported speech. Jen said, uh, re uh, of reported speech. If Jen said, when I say to you, Jen said Neil is currently a professor at the University of Illinois, or Ben said he would, he'd have to miss the conference, blah, blah, blah. That's an example of talking across time, going back in the past. How about going forward in the future? Time moves in one direction only, but as we know, memory is the device by which we, ourselves, can move forward and backward in time. And this is a linguistic mechanism for us to move cognitively forward and backward in time in communication. So there's projected reported speech, like when I get back to the lab, I'm to tell the troops all about this in the way that Jen mentioned earlier. Uh, and it makes wonderful contact with, with, with some of the points that uh, Dan Schachter made earlier about con uh, uh, projection, uh, future imagining, uh, constructing information based on current experience about what you might use in the future. Again, this is the linguistic mechanism for it. I want to give you an analogy of this. The analogy of this comes from the movie Forrest Gump, if you've ever seen it. He's sitting on a bench, uh, a, a bus stop. People come by and he's telling them stories about his life, crazy, unlikely stories about his life from different time frames. Here I'm showing it to you in a, time, in a timeline, orderly timeline, but when he's talking, he's moving back and forth from the present moment to different episodes and back, to a different episode and back, to a different episode and back. This is reported speech. What does it depend upon? It depends upon memory for the past and the ability to, per, to, to bridge those temporal gaps, moving backward and forward in time. Uh, and we explored this in normal folks and patients with hippocampal amnesia and found that patients with hippocampal amnesia used reported speech half as often as did normal folks. Okay, that talking across time, perhaps not surprisingly, depends upon the hippocampal system's memory. So I took you uh, far afield, uh, uh, um, and I want to give a finality that gets us back to Howard in a, in a more personal way. Um, 
about memory systems, how the commitment to reconciling views and data from across species, how to do that, you have to talk about memory representations, and we argue specifically relational memory representations, how the, and the binding of, of the relations among items into memory. And then in return, what you get for that is memory not just of the past, but the ability to do a variety of other things, like navigation and more. So this gets me back to Howard. Howard was, partic was interested in all of these things and partic a particular advocate, I didn't show you his time data, but a particular advocate of the importance of the hippocampal system in time. Uh, in a recent piece about Howard, I wrote, events unfold in space and time. Howard's work greatly advanced our understanding of how the brain captures a record of these events and provides new insights in particular to the aspect of time. So this reminds me, for those who watch such TV, of Doctor Who. The doctor is a time lord who travels across space and time, solving problems, saving the universe, dispensing wisdom. And I'm going to argue that Howard Eichenbaum was one of the time lords, <laughs> clearly one of the time lords. Um, um, our friend Yuri Bajaki might be another. He, got, he talks later at the end of the day about oscillatory rhythms, and uh, he might, might touch on some of the themes. But as I try to move back and forth in time, um, I, what I'm, I'm left with a lingering memory of Howard or a lingering vision of Howard. So I saw Howard very, so, very shortly before he died. And I'll always remember Howard like this, wearing his usual uniform of blue khaki, of blue, of blue Oxford shirt and khaki pants, talking science. We're talking about the next, we were literally talking about the next paper and the next grant to be written while looking out over this incredibly peaceful vista from the deck of, his, of the Eichenbaum House uh, in Chatham on a bay uh, on Cape Cod. Incredibly peaceful view. And uh, all I can say is may Howard rest in peace. Um, clearly deserves it. I have to thank a bunch of people, the people who did all the work, the funding agencies, uh, uh, all of you for listening, but mostly Howard. Thanks so much. Thank you.